Coming up on DTNS, talking to your smart speaker by laser. Plus, computer parts are getting cheap. Are they cheap enough? And Patrick Norton's Tales of Life with only mobile internet. A little late for Halloween, but it's still scary. This is the Daily Tech News Show. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, the 5th of November, 2019, that we remember. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. As just mentioned, host of AVXL and This Week in Computer Hardware, Patrick Norton with us today. Good to have you back, man. Greetings from the Silver Twinkie. And don't mind that husky. It's not congenital. No, so, it's not contagious. It's, it's not congenital either, though, I'm, I assume. Uh, Patrick, yeah. of course, referring to his dog and your, your abode. You're coming to us. With the Silver Twinkie is where you live now. Silver Twinkie, the uh, yeah, we so we are we are packed up. We are in the airstream. We are mobile and uh, heading north shortly. Although we may have to head to Reno to pick up the winter clothing because it's getting colder as we head north. Mm-hmm. As yeah, no, Sarah good point. will attest. We have got a uh, a show for you. We were just talking about V for Vendetta and Red Dwarf uh, and all kinds of good stuff on Good Day Internet. If you want that wider show and our wider conversations about things, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Uber reported its Q3 earnings that beat analyst expectations on revenue at $3.81 billion and a loss per share of $0.68 cents versus $0.81, cents, which was expected. Uber reported a net loss of $1.16 billion for the quarter, which included $401 million in stock-based compensation. During the same quarter last year, Uber lost $986 million, so the losses are going up. But CEO Dara Karzvashahi says that the company expects to reach profitability in 2021. Federal Trade Commission announced Tuesday that AT&T will pay 60 million U.S. dollars to settle a case alleging the company lied to customers about unlimited data plans, which throttled data over a certain threshold. AT&T now must deposit $60 million into a fund providing partial refunds to customers who signed up for unlimited data plans before 2011. AT&T also must disclose any restrictions its unlimited plans have going forward. Yes, that would be nice if it did that. When new users sign up for Disney Plus and ESPN Plus, they'll now see a box promoting signups for the Stars streaming service. The deal was made by Disney in order to get back streaming rights for some movies that had been licensed to Stars. Like Stars Wars, for instance. Yeah. Uh, Google incubator Area 120 launched an app called Pigeon last year in New York City that crowdsources transit information. So kind of like Waze, but letting you know if there's a delay in your bus or your train, that kind of thing. Pigeon's now launching in Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and home of the world champion nationals, Washington, D.C. Pigeon is available for iOS with an Android version on the way. Malaysia will allow motorcycle hailing firms like Gojek to start limited operations beginning in January. Gojek says it will work with Malaysian regulators to determine how best to enter the market. A six-month pilot project will be limited to the the Klang Valley, Malaysia's where the capital Kuala Lumpur is located. Gojek will compete with local company Dago Ride and car hailing service Grab. And Google, ETH Zurich, GND Mobile Security, Nuvoton Technology, and Western Digital have partnered to create Open Titan, an open source secure chip design project, open source hardware. The idea is to build some secure chips for things like data centers, storage, computer peripherals that can be easily inspected for backdoors and be, therefore, very secure. Open Titan will build off Google's own Titan chip design. They use that in their Android phones as well as in the multi-factor security keys. Open Titan will be run by a nonprofit called the Low Risk Community. That's R-I-S-C, Low Risk Community. All right, let's talk a little about Google's new loyalty program. Yeah, Google's launching something called Google Play Points in the U.S. So you can earn points for things that you do within Google Play, like downloading apps or subscribing to services, buying movies, books, TV shows, the like. Points can be redeemed for other things that you would otherwise do in Google Play, like in-app purchases for Pokemon Go, renting a movie, buying an audiobook. Google Play Points, first launched in Japan in September of 2018, came to South Korea in April of this year, and the U.S. program has four levels of its own, bronze through platinum, and points are worth more the higher level that you reach, obviously. Points can be used on a few dozen apps as well as some charitable causes. Google funds the points so developers don't lose any money by participating. 
Yeah. So if like you get up to that platinum level, I, I don't know exactly, but it's something like each point is no longer worth a dollar. It's worth a dollar 40, some, you know, stuff like that. Great way to keep people in the system. It's going to make people open Google play more often, which will make them probably spend more money in Google play. Uh, and it will, uh, Keep people a little more loyal to Android. If they build up a lot of points, they won't want to switch to another platform. I'm not totally sure how uh, successful this will be, but I, it is very genius to gamify the, <laughs> the, the, the method of buying apps and just sort of being in Google Play in general. And, you know, just like, I don't know, it's why I always fly United because I have miles on United. Right. Is it the best airline? Well, yeah, it's pro arguably not. No. But, but, you know, you get, you get into a system and, and, and you end up, uh, you do you do build loyalty with with customers by doing stuff like this, Patrick. I uh, I I I I am trying to decide if I am horrified, disgusted, or just irrified. I I find the <laughs> gaming of buying stuff to be kind of loathsome. I also had to buy a game for my boys, and I had to explain to them that they may get killed every time they open up the game, because about a year ago, the game developers decided to make a whole lot of money selling uh, staggering amounts of uh, accessories or upgrades to a Hey, look, if they build up points, they won't have to spend your money to get those things. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's... Uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, one, it's I, I, it's always nice to get something back because you're going to spend the money on these apps anyway. I just always get a little uptight about the gamification of, of spending. Um, yeah, I'm know. starting to get loyalty program weariness. You know, everybody's <laughs> got one. Uber's got one. I can't keep track because they always they they only work if they end up having their customers spend more money. So you always have to look for the loopholes that are going to trick you into spending more money than you would otherwise, which is exhausting. Well, it's also, I mean, a lot of them mostly exist because they want to capture your information and track your information. Um, I had to, in order to set something up recently, I had to get a, you know, you need an ID from, from this website which is the brand on the thing. So I had to like create an ID, which was basically gathering a bunch of information for marketing purposes. Uh, and then it kicked me back to the original application to log in with my new ID. And I, I just may be weary of just all of the privacy tracking and, uh, it, it's, it, I don't know. I, yeah. I have complicated feels that will not fit in the context of this very short news show. <laughs> Researchers from Tokyo's University of Electrocommunications and the University of Michigan have demonstrated how lasers could activate voice assistance. Microphones in mobile devices and smart speakers use MEMS, micro-electromechanical systems, to detect vibration in the air. They're very sensitive at that. That's why those microphones can be so small and so good. They convert the vibrations of a diaphragm in the microphone into electrical signals. It's just how microphones work. But the diaphragm used in MEMS to detect sound happens to also react to variations in laser light. They're that sensitive. So a nice focused laser beam, a stream of photons, can push that diaphragm a little, and therefore a laser pointed at a MEMS mo microphone and modulated properly will be read as voice by the mic, but you won't be able to hear it unless you can hear laser light uh, and your ear is in the way because it's also line of sight. To pull this off, an attacker would need a laser source like a laser pointer. That's cheap enough. But you also need a laser driver and an audio amplifier. And the laser driver is intended for lab use. So you're going to need someone with some experience with laser equipment to assemble this properly. Not everybody's going to be able to do it just you know, just by going down to their hardware store. Researchers so test really tested Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook devices found that almost all the smart speakers registered the commands from at least 164 feet away. They tested up through 300 feet and then they just didn't test any farther than that. iPhones were only vulnerable from a range of around 33 feet, and uh, Android phones were only able to be controlled within 16 feet for some reason. But you do have to have clear line of sight. They were able to make it work through a window with a telephoto lens that refocused the beam. Uh, but you do have to target that very small microphone exactly accurate as well. Well, we know that uh, if somebody wants to uh, hack a voice assistant, a voice-enabled device, uh, th and they, they have the wherewithal to figure something like this out, someone will do it. So this is definitely a security risk, and it's something that people should understand is possible. It does sound complicated, yes, but I guess my initial question is, okay, well, if that's 
if that's the case, pretty pretty genius hack, really. Then what? How do how do the microphones in these devices have to change so this doesn't happen? I don't know that that is necessarily the solution, right? Like I, I don't know. I, when I say I don't know, I don't know. It may just be like these are fundamentally insecure and don't use them for things that are mm. important, like your door locks. Yeah. Or just turn that, them so the microphones aren't facing any open window. Yeah, that, that's it. so. So it, it would be you know it would be hard to get a laser pointed at him. I mean, if you're around, you'll see the laser if you're paying attention, but you might not be paying sure. attention. The yeah. bigger risk is probably when you're not there and right. someone wants to break in. Um, I think there's also a positive here. You know, at night when you want to be super quiet, you don't even want to whisper. Just uh, point your laser at the thing. <laughs> Uh, I guess you could just use a remote but control at that how point. How does the laser know what you wanted to say? Yeah. Well, you, you have to build it yourself. You have to and, program and, the laser ahead of time. No, now. you have to build one of these with the driver and everything. Yeah. 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 I guess that's not really convenient. No. No. Um, no, you're right. Uh, that the, how to mitigate this is a is an interesting conundrum, and and probably just moving the mic away from line of sight. Is is one of your best uh, one of your best defenses. Send us your favorite defense. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Facebook has announced a corporate rebranding with an all caps version of the word Facebook in gray or whatever color fits some of its sub brands like Instagram or WhatsApp. For example, if you're in WhatsApp, it'll be green. Instagram will be kind of that rainbow Instagram uh, uh, band of colors. Those brands will have a new logo in the form of from Facebook, Facebook all in caps at the bottom of, of pages. The idea is to distinguish the Facebook company from the Facebook social networks. The two different things, guys. To be clear, the social network not changing its logo. It's still that lowercase blue Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the social network uh, where I go and uh, get uh, very angry at my relatives is called Facebook. That's right. But the parent company is called Facebook. Facebook. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and that should make it very good. I mean, this is. It's funny. I. I, I, I told the guys before the show that I asked a, a designer friend of mine who does a lot of uh, corporate identity brand logo stuff. I said, is this what like what's your take? Right. Because I'm not much of an artist. And he was like, this is stupid. And that's it. That's all he had to say. He was just like <laughs> technical was, design language there. That, yeah. You know, yeah. And I, I was like. Believe. I was like, I mean, really, like, it's not, it doesn't look stupid. He said, nice. it doesn't look stupid. It's just, this is just going to further confuse people. I mean, you don't want to have different versions of the Facebook logo all over the place because people don't understand the difference between Facebook, the company and Facebook, the social network. I mean, we do, our listeners do, but, uh, in general, it does sort of dilute, um, the well, logo in general. Facebook well, made a decision who... that they didn't want to change the name of the parent company like Alphabet did. Uh, and so when they did that, they then decided, well, but we also want to remind people that Instagram and WhatsApp are part of us because we think that'll help keep folks from wanting to break us up if they think of us less as a conglomerate that owns a bunch of things and more as like a family. So yeah. they wanted to brand those things. I'm not sure this is going to achieve what they want when most people think Facebook is too big and putting the Facebook name on more things makes it look bigger. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it just what Sarah was saying was if you look at Ford went to do a new logo, I don't know, maybe in the late 60s, early 70s. And the thing that's so pathetic is you, you look at the, the options they were looking at at that time and you're just like, oh, my goodness, that's so incredibly pathetic and dated. Um, and also it's like so we have Facebook, the 300 pound gorilla, um, you know, a small chicken. Uh, and, you know, this sort of svelte, nice house caddy kind of thing that also weighs two or three hundred pounds. And it's and the whole idea of like branding is Facebook is going to dilute people's fear of Facebook and the horrible things they do on such a regular basis with our information is just I mean, that's incredible wishful thinking for a company that big and that smart. I think there's a there, there's a little bit of effect, right? If I love WhatsApp and I'm like, oh, end-to-end right. -end secure encryption, and I, I've heard people say this, why can't Facebook be more like that? If they look and see, oh, wait, Facebook makes this, sure, it will have that effect in those cases. I don't, okay. I'm, I'm with you, Patrick. I don't think that effect outweighs the other effect that yeah. it will also have. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's just yeah. going to make more people... Uh, when they are angry at other things, think of Facebook that way. I, I think of CNET. When CNET started buying other properties like Download.com, like GameSpot, 
uh, they changed the parent company name to CNET Networks because they, like Facebook, wanted to keep the branding in the parent company name. They didn't want to go as extreme right. as Alphabet did with Google. Mm -hmm. But CNET Networks implied, oh, this is different. It's not just CNET. It's the other networks that are involved with CNET. Facebook just branding themselves as we're Facebook, but also Facebook. I don't know that it achieves that either. Well, it's also funny because it's such a sophisticated piece of typography compared to like the Facebook logo. It's like, I'm fun. I'm cheerful. You want to have me as your first college roommate? And then you get to Facebook. Like, oh, we're big fans <laughs> of the Lincoln Mark V typography. So we just copied that in gray. Every once in a while, I, I have to sort of take a step back and be like, the company is called Facebook. I mean, it's it's sort of silly. It's just become it's such a part of life. Mm -hmm, Not for right everybody, up. you know, but for that you had. It, I don't know. We used to make fun of the name Google, and nobody even bothers with that anymore. Sure, uh, but sure. but but Facebook is. I it is a it's a rather silly company name considering what the company has become. Well, that's good news for Peacock. Then maybe we'll get used to that. <laughs> right. Free. Uh, I think this is a decent name. Freedom House has issued its internet freedom rankings, which it does regularly, uh, and has found a worldwide decline in freedom on the internet. Freedom House has been around for a long time. Uh, they evaluate things like freedom of the press and, and of late uh, freedom of the internet. Iceland and Estonia, T2T2, you can raise that flag fl high. Iceland and Estonia remained at the top of the charts. China and Iran are at the bottom of the internet freedom charts. While censorship is one of the factors it measures, it's found this report that disinformation and propaganda have seen significant increases, and those are also negatives for internet freedom. Freedom House President Mike Abramowitz said, quote, many governments are finding that on social media, propaganda works better than censorship. So just uh, get, get a message out there on the social networks to counteract the thing you want to combat, and you do better than trying to suppress the thing you want to combat. Uh, surveillance, which also has a chilling effect on speech when you think people are watching, you're less likely to do certain things, also on the rise. In fact, the United States and China have both expanded monitoring of social media significantly. Uh, if you're like, wait a minute, who are these Freedom House guys? They were started in 1941 by Republican presidential candidate Wendell Wilkie and the wife and first lady uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, currently 86 percent wife of President Roosevelt and first lady Eleanor Roosevelt. And it's currently 86 percent funded by U.S. government grants. Well, yeah, so you know, considering the world we live in, it doesn't surprise me that um, suppressing uh, information is I mean, it's possible sometimes, but we're, as we all know, it's getting harder and harder to do. Um, being able to spread pr propaganda to mitigate what might be information that you you want uh, you don't want out there, uh, or that's incorrect, or 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 you're incorrect, and and you're trying to you know confuse people further, it. It contributes to a lot of noise, uh, and so it's not necessarily the you know the the right uh, direction I think we should be going in. But it does make sense that that's kind of the way it works right now. And it does seem to be something that uh, you 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 see being used not just by governments but but by activist organizations as well. So I'm uh, it's it's a good warning, just to just something to keep in mind. All right, let's talk numbers, fall-in numbers, in fact. Micron's revenue dropped 23%. Seagate revenue dropped 25%. Samsung reported a 52% fall in profit. Not good news for investors, but very good news if you're building a PC because it's going to be cheaper than it was before. PC parts in general have been getting cheaper all year. A 16-gigabyte DDR4 kit that might have cost you hmm, upwards of $150 or more in recent memory now sells for around $75. And with Singles Day coming in China, that's uh, November 11th, and Black Friday to follow in the U.S. at the end of this month, deals on already cheap arts are going to be cheap parts rather are going to be very attractive. If you like to build or modify your desktop, and we just so happen to have Patrick Norton with us today. So, Patrick, what is the good news here? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I had a conversation with my, uh, a friend of mine, one of my neighbors, um, and he was like, ah, I wanted a new PC, but everything's so expensive. And I'm like, what's the last time you checked prices? And he was like, what? 
Um, and I, you know, we were looking at, uh, we were talking about this before. When you look at the Amazon price history, I love camel, camel, camel.com, right? Um, it is an incredible tool to figure out whether or not, for example, something you're shopping for, for black Friday, is it actually a black Friday deal? Um, and you want to get the information early because if you are thinking about buying something at black Friday, sometimes popular items, have an entire new Amazon entry created. So all of the price history for the product, if it's been around for a while, magically disappears, sometimes temporarily just for Black Friday and Cyber Monday, which I find really loathsome. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens occasionally. Um, but when you look at, uh, when you look at, for example, uh, memory uh, prices, Corsair Vengeance, uh, 16 gigabyte DDR4 RAM, one of the most popular memory products on there, uh, peaked out at like $220, uh, I want to say January 2018, February 2018. And, you know, it's back down to the $65, $75 range for 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, that's as low as it's been since mid-2016, which is awesome. Uh, it sucks for memory manufacturers. Uh, it is great uh, if you're thinking about building a uh, new PC. Same thing for uh, uh, SSD drives. Um, SSD prices have been dropping off of a cliff. It's you know it's easy to get a decent uh, non-NVMe drive and a standard SSD drive. Um, you know, I think Samsung's 860 Evo, the 500 gigabyte version, uh, if you look at the history, you know, back in early 2018, that was selling for like $150. They're down to like 70 bucks now. One terabyte drives, by the way, uh, under $150 from most of the major manufacturers uh, of SSDs. Not NVMe, those are a little more expensive, but it has been amazing to watch the prices drop down. We had something we affectionately refer to as Shrout's Law on this week in computer hardware. Uh, Ryan Shrout now, of course, works for Intel doing internal benchmarking, but uh uh, he, you know, his thing was like, he's not going to be happy till SSDs are actually down to 10 cents a gigabyte. And we've actually been seeing those prices being hit on like non-sale prices, depending on the part wow. when you're looking at it. Yeah. So if you don't have an SSD, it's time. Yeah. It's so awesome. And that uh, camel, camel, camel .com is a great resource, uh, especially like you say on sale days. If you're like, is this really cheap? Because it looks cheap. That's a, that's a, that's an excellent resource. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Patrick, as we mentioned earlier in the show is, is sort of, uh, taken off on the, on the road, uh, a little <laughs> bit these days, which means you're relying entirely. Am I right? On mobile internet? Pretty much entirely. Unless we stop in at a hotel or unless we're mm -hmm. say at an empty, uh, uh, RV park, uh, like a KOA, um, we are pretty much actually for all intents and purposes when when you look at a lot of places like uh, campgrounds of america is a popular place to park rvs most of them actually have that we've stayed at actually throttle internet so you can kind of download web pages and answer email but you're not going to stream anything off of their internet and uh so we kind of moved out and i was waiting for a decent to find like a better plan uh, in terms of the amount of data we would get and uh, the my family blew through the I have a, a an old 50 gigabytes a month guaranteed without throttling plan on AT and T and they blew through that in like 15 days <laughs> and yeah. I was like uh oh <laughs> and uh, and what's interesting is uh, when you when you talk about mobile data when you talk about wireless data uh, nobody really wants to sell data in bulk period um, several years ago. Uh, it got to the point where, you know, I used to have a plan where I, I would get like 25, 30 gigabytes and then I could buy additional blocks of data. And then, of course, everything went to unlimited, which I'll make fun of and, and talk smack about in a moment. Um, but and then it went from you could buy additional blocks of data to, oh, nope, we're going to shut you down to 128K. And uh, in my case, you know, uh, I had I had I was at CES one year and the Internet we were provided with was trash and. You know, I was able to, you know, I went through like 25 gigabytes of data and then bought like another 25 gigabytes of data, which was expensive for what it was, but compared to the monthly fee, but was manageable and allowed us to actually, you know, do the uploading we needed to do to meet our production deadlines. Uh, these days, their goal is not to sell data. Their goal is to basically, you know, we'll guarantee you this much. And after that, they throttle you. So in case you didn't know, and I'm sure everybody listening to the Daily Tech News shows knows this, unlimited basically means you get X number of gigabytes, then they have their choice of throttling you at that point, or they automatically throttle you. And if they say they throttle you to 128K, but you get all the 128K data you want, 
until the next billing cycle. <laughs> it turns out a lot of websites won't actually load at 128K. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or not they have large graphics, active server pages. So just as a surprise. Um, so at that point, I was like, oh, well, now I got to go, you know, now I got to go pull the ripcord and, and buy a whole bunch of internet. And uh, one of the only... Uh, companies that is offering a plan with more than like 20, 25 uh, gigabytes of data is Sprint, and they will give you. You have to buy one of their uh, one of their uh, wireless hotspots. I did a MiFi uh, 8000, but uh, you get 100 gigabytes of data for 60 gigs a month. Speed's not spectacular for 60 bucks but, a month. Yeah, 100 gigabytes yeah. for 60 bucks a month, which is yeah. incredibly low for wireless data. Uh, and then uh, I found out about, there's a website called rvmobileinternet.com. And uh, I'd known about these uh, guys for a while. And I went back to him when uh, Sasha Sagan, who uh, does all the editing, uh, or he's basically the, runs the the mobile group over at pcmag.com. He's like, oh, you need to go. I was like, I know about them. They're awesome. And uh, rvmobileinternet.com, one of the things they do is they track all of the deals on large amounts of wireless data because they tend to sort of pop up. And if they're successful, somebody in the company panics and they kill the project off. For example, Verizon had a fast dating, unlimited prepaid data plan, which is a huge deal because Verizon has the best coverage, especially west of the Mississippi, for the United States. Uh, and they have an excellent, incredibly fast network. Uh, so they, for, for a brief, like for several minutes, uh, it was actually several weeks, uh, you could actually get an actual, genuine, unlimited data Verizon plan. Uh, I spent like three weeks trying to find one to buy with zero success. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, you know, what I ended up doing was buying, uh, there's a company called Togo, who's from an RV manufacturer called Thor. Uh, and they have a branded version of this wine guard device. It looks like a giant salad bowl or Tupperware bowl. Uh -huh. uh, and it's about eight inches high and about 16 inches wide. And it's got a, a uh, mediocre but acceptable router and a 4G LTE, uh, uh, you know, radio with a couple of antennas and it's designed to perch on top of your be bolted to the top of your in my case airstream your rv and it comes with for an extra 360 dollars a year an unlimited data plan wow uh, and yes. who do they it, use as the carrier for that at and okay. that's the only thing it'll run with uh getting mm -hmm. it to run in a way this is actually I'm, I'm very excited because this is my first actual uh attempt with this where i've successfully been able to run an actual Skype conversation. So that is the connection you're using right now. Right now. And have been using for the past, you know, the entire show. So that's Which, yeah. yeah, I I was I was kind of waiting for that because I know everybody listening was like, but what is he using now? And anybody who's watching our video, I mean your video is good. You know, you seem yeah. up and running for, you know, uh considering the limitations that you're dealing with. It's been interesting. The performance, it's funny because uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of what I will effectively call a, a conversation and learning process with tech support for the company that built the box, um, <laughs> you know, because I started asking lots of questions. And, you know, I had some questions about the performance, which originally was not so good. And I got this boilerplate back, this cut and paste boilerplate back that was like, ATD hey, reserves the right. I'm like, no, that's not the plan I have. That's not the boilerplate I signed for doesn't really matter because AT&T can basically do whatever they want at any time based on their boilerplate, their, excuse me, their uh, licensing agreement. Um, but uh, it's been fun because at this point it's gone from being sort of unusable to like, hey, this is actually, I can stream video on this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's also amazing how little uh, bandwidth Skype actually needs. Uh, for like 720B streaming, you, do, you should be able to do pretty well with a, a megabyte up. But uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would, you know, poke around on the app and see exactly what my bandwidth is right now. But I'm afraid if I do that, I'll probably <laughs> kill this conversation. You'll bring everything so, down. We'll yeah. try it after DTNS is done and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I know there's somebody out there going like, what about Google Fi? And the problem with Google Fi is it's $10 per gigabyte after 15 gigabytes. And, you know, so that that's, adds up. I mean, you could, you can buy it, uh, but yeah, it's going to add up really fast. Well, I, I, was, I think that, RVMobileInternet.com is definitely uh, a great resource for a lot of people out there. Oh, give us the name of, of the mushroom, uh, the salad bowl again. <laughs> the Togo C2 Roadlink or the Togo Roadlink C2. Togo uh, Roadlink C2. Like to go. Togo yes. Roadlink I guess it's C2. probably what I'm supposed to be saying is to go Roadlink C2. I like uh, Togo. That's much better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think of Jim Belushi and Terrible Things in Animal House. Um, right. It definitely made me think of togas, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah or Togo the sandwich shop. Yeah. 
excuse me, to go. Awesome. Both links Thank to you, here. Patrick. Appreciate You're that. Welcome. We'll uh, awesome. we'll have links to all this stuff in the show notes as well. Thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit. You guys, you know, you guys and gals, uh, submit lots of stuff um, related to the conversation that we just had. Keep it coming. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Also, join in on the conversation on our Discord, where you can link to at patreon.com/dtns. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Dave and Madison, Wisconsin, wrote in with a couple of really good points, um, and this was uh, in in response to yesterday's show, Monday's show. Dave says, regarding the AirPods Pro and their new noise canceling feature, I had the opportunity to attend some live music over the weekend, forgot my earplugs. I did have the new AirPod Pros in my pocket though. Since I was wearing my Apple Watch, I knew that the ambient sound levels were around 110 decibels sustained. However, popping in the AirPods and turning on the noise reduction prevented me getting any tinnitus the next day. So while that probably isn't advertised use of them, <laughs> it worked out great in my case and I'm thankful for having had them. Then uh, Dave goes on to say, regarding the data storage on glass story, I, I work for a very large research university's library as a programmer and we have very large data sets that don't change once they're established. Something like the glass type of data storage would be perfect for our needs. I'm especially curious how it could be used for things like our digital collections, for example, the DARE fieldwork recordings. Currently, we use a few options, even tape backups, one of which is a service like Amazon Glacier, which is super cheap to store, uh, and keep, but costs a little bit more to restore. Having another medium like the glass storage mentioned would be really valuable to us. Oh, that's great. Uh, and 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 uh, very uh, very resourceful using the uh, the AirPods Pro for a little noise reduction. That's a that's a great tip. Thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you everyone who emails us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also, shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including uh, Degrasha A. Daniels, Tim Deputy, and Kevin S. Morgan. And also thanks to Patrick Norton for being with us today. Patrick, you're on the move. Uh, well, we're so glad to have you and can't wait to have you back wherever you may be next. Let folks know where they can keep up with uh, your you know, your life, your goings on. Uh, Twit.tv slash Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. Just search for it on your favorite podcaster or avxcel.com. Robert and I finally got avxcel up and running again and uh, did our first episode in quite a long time uh, earlier this weekend. And it's up for our patrons and about to go out to everybody who subscribes to the podcast. We have new Patreon rewards right here. Uh, Daily Tech News Show. Get a peek at our show rundown as we develop it. Behind the scenes chats. Join in our Discord, like we said. Sign up right now. And you actually, if you sign up by November 25th, uh, you'll get included on our holiday greeting card. Len Peralta, hard at work on a new design. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll send you a holiday card if you sign up right now. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Would you like to send us an electronic email? Electronic mail, rather. Darn it, man, I messed that up. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>